Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The direction of attention. My God, you've given the grace to perform this action with you and through love for you. In advance, I offer to you all the good that I may do and accept all the difficulty I may meet therein. St. Francis de Sales, pray for us. St. Margaret of Scotland, pray for us. Excellent. So, we're going to look at <coughs> this piece. Um, where did it go? Got it over here. No, 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 not that. <laughs> oh, I know why I did this, because this is the ones prior to what we're going to do. Yeah. So this is the 20, uh, the 21 councils of the church. These are the first 20. I'm not going to review all those, just to name them. In the beginning of our series, we did a lot of these. I have talked about them. Um, in the list of the 20 ecumenical councils, the early council was never added as one of those. It was just a council with the apostles. These are the ones without the apostles in the um, uh, time from them to now, right? So that's, but that's a good, that's a good list of them all and the dates that they all took place. No further on that. So the Second Vatican Council really involves two popes. So we're gonna take a few moments to look at each pope. And then I would like to do, do is to identify the four themes that, um, the Second Vatican Council outlined and how that evolves. So, John XXIII, his name was Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli, born in 1881, a son of a peasant farmer. Interesting, he had his doctorate in theology um, before he was ordained. Uh, this is a typo. He was not ordained in uh, 1904, just a few weeks, actually just about a month later, he was ordained a priest he became a professor of church history in uh, 2006. I think that's interesting because John the 23rd had a good understanding of uh, the evolution of not just events, but how things developed and why they developed and how the world impacted the evolution of things taking place through his, the history of the church. So he's gonna bring a, quite a bit of insight into that. Um, he's an intellect and understands things. Um, so that, that's a good piece. Um, he became a bishop in 1925. Um, he was an effective peacemaker. Um, it said he uh, dealt with General Charles de Gaulle. Um, that was during the um, time of um, Second World War with um, the regime that was put in place. Um, he called it a puppet regime uh, and not all the bishops stood up to that. And so, uh, so Charles, uh, uh, Bishop Roncalli was involved in kind of bringing some peace about that. He was, um, uh, Roncalli was um, a friend of Pius XII, um, who eventually made him a cardinal just five years before he became the Pope. And he was named Patriarch of Venice. Um, just a little details about his life. Uh, so what we're interested in is at the age of 76, he was elected Pope. Um, just, uh, let's see, um, nine days after my birthday, <laughs> uh, or the day I was born, put it that way. So in my lifetime, um, primarily the only Pope that I ever known was from, obviously I didn't know anything about Pius XII, I was too young. Um, the members of the Curia thought he was an old man. Remember, this is a part of the history where the Curia ran the church, um, and I'm not so sure that they still do, it sounds like they still do so, but not in the same way. Um, and they thought he would make a good interim pope and wouldn't rock the boat. Well, history would prove how wrong they were. Cardinal Spellman said, he's no pope, he should be selling bananas. <laughs> he was from New York. <laughs> pope Francis, I mean, Pope John XXIII, you know, was not a high intellect, and so, but he was. But he had the appearance and, and people um, didn't give him the credit that he had. Uh, yes? How do you define the curia? So the curia is all of, the way you looked at it in terms of government, <coughs> It's like the Congress and Senate, 
the cabinet okay. kind of I, I would say more like the cabinet you know the people that that are have all the different run all the different departments so that is the, the people the curia are all those so they would have oversee of the finances uh, the propaganda of faith marriage sacraments liturgy all down the line but he oversaw the curia he was a part of the curia yeah. uh, in his time now as pope he would oversee the curia yeah. um, and all popes do that because they all work for him is that a lost cause? Yeah. Uh, yes, we declare it. Okay. <laughs> I, this is just another little, I think that one of the things that Pope John the 23rd had a great sense of humor. Um, one time someone said to him, Your Holiness, how many people work in the Vatican? He paused and he said, about half of them. <laughs> <laughs> Shortly after he was elected as Pope, he was walking the streets of Rome when a woman pa uh, passed him and said to her friend, my God, he's so fat. <laughs> Overhearing her, her remark, he turned around and replied, Madam, I trust you understand that the papal conclave is not exactly a beauty contest. <laughs> in the 1940s, when John was still an archbishop and the papal nuncio or ambassador in Paris, he was, a, he was at an elegant dinner party seated across from a woman wearing a very low cut dress that exposed a good deal of cleavage. Someone turned to him and said, your eminence, what a scandal. Aren't you embarrassed that everyone is looking at the woman? And he said, oh no, everyone's looking at me to see if I'm looking at her. <laughs> <laughs> so I think his down to earth kind of uh, really endeared himself to people um, in his time. So he becomes the Pope. Um, uh, in October of 1958, and January 22nd, 1959, he makes the first public announcement that there will be a council. <coughs> and he invites all the bishops, 2,594, the 156 major superiors. Every religious community has a major superior who's the over who sees them. Uh, ours is Father Barry Strong. Uh, and other members of universities to submit suggestions. Now, can you imagine trying to pull together all that data to see where things would go? But anyway, they did so, and then uh, on October 11th, 1962, the council opens. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what happens in that. He is, um, uh, presides at the first of the uh, sessions. Um, my understanding is there were four sessions. He sat through the first, and there's usually a period of break in between them and then they have, so there were four sessions. He presided over the first. Uh, it was in between the first and the second uh, that, uh, uh, and the second session was to, to open in September of 1963, and he died on June 3rd from stomach cancer. Um, so effectively, the council's done. That's what happens when there's a council. It can only convene by the willingness and the directive of a pope. Only a pope can call it, and a pope can close it at any time. Um, so at the death of uh, John the 23rd, um, that ends. Um, it's, it's, so it's worth now, and he said what, uh, one of his great quotes, Christian, Christian unity was the pope's distant goal, but his immediate aim was to let in some fresh air into the church and to bring the church up to date. That was his quote. Um, after he dies, um, then comes on the board Paul VI. A few comments about Paul VI, and then we'll look at the actual council, because both of these individuals are very influential in this. Um, he was born in 1897 in Italy. Um, his father was Giorgio, a lawyer, editor, and eventually a member of the Italian chamber. His mother was very involved in Catholic action data. After his ordination, he studies literature, philosophy, and canon law, which is very interesting, and then becomes part of the secretariat in 1924, uh, where he worked for 30 years. Who's also working in the Curia during that time? John the 23rd. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so th there's obviously they would have known each other because of those. Um, he was a, uh, the chaplain of the Federation of Italian Catholic Universities, 
became a good friend of this guy named, named Aldo Moro, who became prime minister. He was kidnapped by the Red Brigade and was, was uh, murdered. Uh, and the Pope presided his funeral. Take note of the date, March 1978, because Pope Paul VI dies in September of that year. So this story is that was a very heartbreaking thing for him, and he himself would have passed not too long after that. He was made Archbishop. Um, he was the Archbishop of the workers and visit factories um, all throughout the war. So just a little bit of that. Um, this is the point I want to get. In 1958, usually it's in November-ish, uh, because always at the beginning of the uh, liturgical year in December has been the, is the standard is that a pope uh, appoints new cardinals. So obviously it was one of the earliest things he did. And so he appointed 23 cardinals and very interesting, um, uh, Cardinal Archbishop Martini was one of the first to be picked. Um, and, and after that, the next election, obviously he was elected. Interesting, the little tidbit there. Um, when he was elected Pope, in June 1960, it decided to continue the council, uh, which had three more sessions. And in, you know, it's, it's a state, the church is very, lots of things begin and end on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. And so that was very deliberate. Um, and one of the things that he was very interested in doing is kind of addressing, trying to bring about some type of dialogue uh, with other Christian churches and not, not having that separation that everybody's going to hell if they're not Catholic. And so we want to have at least a dialogue about a, a, a common belief in Christ. And that was part of his work. He then became Pope um, and continued the council. Um, and he oversaw three of the sessions, the last three of the sessions, uh, which ended in 1965. So 62 to 65, there were four sessions of time periods where they all came together. Um, People say, you know, are we going to see? Uh, um, I would be a betting man that in our lifetime, there will not be another council. Um, many of the um, works and the vision of Vatican II is only really, even though it's been 50 some years, almost 60 years now, uh, not all the, the, the vision of the Vatican Council uh, has been put into place. So there's lots of, of growth there to take place. Could it happen? Yes. Um, but, you know, take note, there's one about every 100 years, so um, statistically breaking it out. Questions with that much so far, before we start delving into the themes? Just, just can you help me understand the difference? I understand what, what the council is, but where does the synod fit into that? So the synod is a working process that would have come out of Vatican II, the notion of it, because it's part of the, because one of the themes of Vatican II is collegial work. In other words, um, from the, the Council of Trent up until Vatican II, the, the notion of the papacy being the word on everything uh, without, and it, it wasn't required to have consultation with all the bishops. Vatican II went back to the original intention of the collegiality of the apostles working together. Um, and that's very evident in the way in which they worked to resolve um, the resolution around the Council of Jerusalem. You know, they called on the Holy Spirit and they talked it out uh, respectfully to get a conclusion. Um, and then they all agreed on that. Um, so that's a collegial model. And that got lost at Council of Trent, and it became very focused on whatever the Pope says. And that was all around the concept and the dialogue we had around the um, uh, infallibility, right? And of course, once you define infallibility, you know, most Popes don't even have an opportunity to um, define something as infallible. In fact, only two Popes have actually done it as themselves, as without the Council. 
All the rest are within the councils. Questions? Good. So the overarching theme of the council was to have a renewed understanding of the church, an understanding of the church itself and the church in relationship to the world, to other Christian traditions and its relation to other faiths in the secular world. Both of those were, that's kind of the global perspective that they wanted to achieve. Pope Paul VI said, by now the conciliar doctrines must be seen as belonging to the magisterium, <coughs> official teaching of the church, and be in, uh, indeed attributed to the breath of the Holy Spirit. And what he was trying to get here is that the magisterium, as it was reimagined, uh, trying to get in touch with the earliest church, was that the magisterium functions when, and this will be, and then I'll be able to answer your question more directly, um, is when the bishops are working um, in uh, continuity with the Pope. It's not the Pope and everybody else, it's the Pope and the bishops working together. And so we find ourselves in a challenging times when in the collegiality of the bishops working with the Pope who is the leader of them, um, then some bishops saying that the Pope is wrong and how much that really undermines the whole um, structure of what has been understood in years in over the history. And it becomes complex for people to understand, well, if they can't get it right, how are we supposed to get it right? So there's really an importance of them, you know, not, and that doesn't say they can't have differences, but to talk about those differences and then to be uh, working together. So that is the vision of Second Vatican Council that there will be this collegiality among the successors to the apostles. And the leader of those successors is Peter. Um, and so they need to be working together. So one way that came out of that was to gather these groups uh, and have opportunity for people to come according to what's called a synod. And the synod will be working bodies to uh, try to, to talk out where are things and what are the issues of the day and what do we need to do to help things move forward and whatever the, the Holy Spirit. Very much Paul VI's vision was that, and this is really in line with the Council of Jerusalem and the Apostles, that the work of the um, magisterium or the, the successors to the Apostles with the Pope is about paying attention to the work of the Holy Spirit. Both John the Twenty-Third and Paul VI were very strong components about listening to the directive of the of the um, Spirit, and not getting too you know, and, and Pope John the Twenty-Third had made some statements like he had a certain thing that he wanted to happen, but there was some in his writing saying that he was open to if it doesn't go the way he thinks it should, he was going to listen to the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of the approach in which he took um, as he opened that council. Um, and I think that would explain why also of what um, Pope John Paul II and John Paul I, I think just in, in naming themselves, um, were reflecting. Right? And I think John Paul I is the one who really, and that is that he called himself John Paul, John Paul, trying to take the best of what these two had done in terms of the Second Vatican Council to allow it to continue to unfold because the life of it hadn't been achieved by 1979 or when, when um, <clears throat> Paul VI died. So this was John Paul I's vision that he would, but he only lived for 33 days. And then, of course, John Paul II did take on that and, 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 and continue some of that work. Uh, you can see a lot of John Paul, Paul VI in John Paul II. Paul VI was one who did a lot of traveling, which very few popes before him did that, all right, going around the world. And of course, John Paul II gave a whole new vision in terms of what he did in his um, um, 20, 20, let's say 21 and four, 25 years that he was in office, okay? Now let's look at these themes. So, there were, uh, in fact, the, the language that the history says is that there were four movements 
at the Second Vatican Council. One that was ecclesial, we'll talk about that. One that was biblical, one was liturgical, and one was ecumenical. All right, so four themes um, that, that, that evolved from this. The ecclesial movement. Obviously, that the word ecclesia is um, the word for church. Um, and the goal was to rediscover an understanding of the church founded on biblical and patriotic sources, the early fathers of the church. Early church had a communion of local churches with bishop as the focus of unity. The episcopy viewed as pyramid model, and the council called forth a communion model. That was a, what, what was at the, at the change here, that, 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 that model of pope and, and bishops that was supposed to be a communal model. Clearly, though, the role of the, of the papacy with the pope was not lost, but it was going to be more collegial as opposed to just one man saying what was and wasn't without any discussion. The early church employed a more extensive process of initiation. And so one of the things that came out of the Second Vatican Council was the establishment of what we call the RCIA, the Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults, which has now been <coughs> renamed to OCIA for Order of um, Christian Initiation of Adults. I don't know the difference. So I'm not a liturgist, so I, never, I, I don't know, really, I've never understood what the difference between order and right, but, but um, do you know it? No, I, I have a question. So when did RCIA start? Um, probably around 1972. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, with the council ending in 65, it took some time for things to kind of unfold. Um, uh, so I remember being um, a, I was a brother. Uh, I was assigned to a church for a year, um, and it was called St. John Newman Church, and, and they, um, they had, um, the pastor said to me, um, I have five people who need to become Catholic, so meet with them. Um, and, and I said, well, how'd you do it? He said, well, I just met with them individually, and when they were ready, I baptized them. <laughs> so I had said, you know, now this was 1985, so it was about 13 years later. Um, in the, my own formation and in my own experience of, of Catholic theology, I understood the ICIA, so I actually started it for that parish uh, in a very small way, because uh, it took many years for it to get to where it is. Um, but the idea is that it's a process of, uh, of, of becoming a Catholic. In the only church, you didn't just, you know, like, you know, Paul, you know, spent three days, it was blind, and he got light, and then we're going to hear this in the scripture readings tomorrow, and then he was baptized. Boom. It's over, done with, and he's good. Um, well, there's a lot more to that. So the, the church in, in, in 1972 wanted to have a more of a process of helping people grow in their understanding of the faith, uh, and, it, and that took time. We weren't just going to hand you the, uh, the Baltimore Catechism and say, memorize this, and once you got it right, you pass the test, you're good to go. This was a process of understanding and learning with the intent that when the, pro when the, when the process is done at the Easter Vigil, then there would be ongoing education. So one of the <coughs> things that I found helpful um, in my first pastoral experience at the oratory was a doing classes around adult education, because that is the ongoing adult formation. It doesn't stop with receiving the sacraments for children and or us. And so well, this size of a group, and, and it's continued over these three years, is just an indication of people's thirst for that kind of learning. There was a constitution, there's a number of constitutions, you know, reading these documents are heavy and take a lot of work because they're written very precisely and so they have to be, all, a lot of times they have to be unpacked. The constitutional church called the light to the nations, which is the opening words of the text, 
and the word for that is Lumen Gentium. And there were new images for the church, like Bride of Christ, Sacrament of God's Love, Body of Christ, People of God. The church consisted of all the baptized, right? which is a whole different way of looking at it because prior to that you would have said the church and you were talking about the bishops or you're talking about the Vatican. Now when we talk about church, we're talking about an entity that's not just the building, that's not just uh, the, um, the ecclesial structure in Rome, but now there is a, a role for the, all of the laity, the whole church working together. Um, and it's built on those imageries of St. Paul in the scriptures, uh, where the body and the head need to work together. There's, and that's all um, part of that. All the baptized are called to holiness, not just those in monasteries. That is a key piece of this document. And I'm gonna take a moment to reflect on that because, uh, now up to 2024, this slide's old. Mm -hmm. I borrowed it. Um, but I, I like to recall this because this was uh, a significant work uh, from Francis de Sales in the 17th century. So Francis de Sales was one of the first to really talk about this concept that to become holy, one did not need to escape the world. Now, some days we look at things in the world and we're saying, maybe it would be best we all escaped it. But that's not the view of how God and the Vatican II and, and so forth wants to look at the world. The world has its challenges, but it's a place in which we need to live, and holiness can exist in the midst of it. And so, but before, the, as that evolves, the beginning of this is to try to change a mentality. If you wanted to be, if you were a woman, and you wanted to be holy, you had one option in the 17th century. Become a nun. Go to a monastery. And not to become a sister, go, you become a nun. Right? And that was the way it was total. In fact, Francis de Sales had a model for the Sisters of the Visitation that included going out periodically to do some ministry, bringing food and things to the poor. And his initial vision, uh, in order for the visitation order to get their uh, constitutions approved, the Vatican had said that the only way they would approve them in 16, uh, it was around 1614, was that the, the sisters were cloistered. So Francis acquiesced and was obedient to that in order for the vision to go forward. Orders of the Sisters of St. Joseph were founded about 50 years later, and they did get their um, request approved that they could be uh, more apostolic and go out and do ministry uh, in, in the world. But it took time. But Francis at the time was saying, but you didn't have to go to a monastery to become holy. You can do it in the midst of your own uh, experiences where you lived. This all is um, written with lots of clarity in his work called <laughs> The Introduction to the Devout Life. <laughs> Because the word devout for Francis de Sales uh, was about uh, trying to be a holy person um, and in the world. And he writes, God invites all Christians to bring forth fruits of devotion, each in his or her own position or vocation in life. He writes, it's an error or rather a heresy to wish to banish the devout life from the regiment of soldiers, the mechanic shop, the court of princes, or the home of married people. And so that was something he put out there and it was really adopted strongly at the Second Vatican Council, all right? And that is a perspective that affects all of us in the 21st century in terms of how we live our lives and what we can do to achieve holiness. Um, a, a quick, you know, I'm a saint in the making. To be saints is not a privilege of the few, but a vocation for everyone. Um, Fran, this quote really captures it. Be who you are and be that well, to give honor to the master craftsman whose handiwork you are. So this notion that it can be achieved is very much 
in the, in the writings of Francis de Sales, but it becomes a piece of the Second Vatican Council that's put out there for all to kind of understand. That was revolutionary, if you will, um, in terms of how to look at um, opportunities to become holy, all right? If I would define that, loving others and doing what, doing that with kindness to the people you see every day is a part of that holiness. Um, it's recognizing the grandeur of God in the holy, but it's also recognizing the beauty of God in the simple acts of how we care for one another. And so there is a blend in this theology of, of, of recognizing this, this majestic as well as this very practical way that it's within the way in which we take this respect and love for God and make it real in the way in which we choose to live our lives. The word that will capture this is in the theology of the sales and in the theology of the Second Vatican Council. And it's called incarnational theology. And it's really going to be the very bottom line of what they're going to understand liturgy to lead us to in terms of how we choose to live our lives. And that is for us as the church, the people of God, the body of Christ, to become the body of Christ. And so those phrases, to become the body of Christ, be who you are, become the body of Christ, make it come alive in the way in which you live your life, those are all realities of what the Vatican Council envisioned for people in terms of the call to holiness. Questions with that much? That's not radical for our understanding, but it's so very rooted in this, and I would not be a, an authentic oblate if I didn't highlight it. Um, so that's the ecclesial movement, uh, this notion that we, uh, the church is bigger than just the structures. Second movement is around the biblical movement. Now, this these points should have been on, uh, as what was communicated to us when we did all that Bible series, all right? Because, uh, and, and as popular as this piece has been, that was even more popular, wasn't it? And people came to those sessions. Um, because much before that, especially before Vatican II, there was not a whole lot of um, really openness for us to proceed to understand <clears throat> the Bible. Um, in 2002, the Biblical Commission restricted Catholic Bible scholarship. Following the Council of Trent, only the bishop has the authority to interpret scripture. All right? So, now of course that opens a Pandora's box as well, right? When everybody can have a say. In 1943, um, Pius XII, in, in what was called Divino Afalante Spiritu, inspired by the Holy Spirit, embraced the historical critical method to provide a more coherent understanding and interpretation of scripture text. This, what would eventually be called historical critical method, was a way to try to understand the text by not re looking at them and looking for the literal interpretation. We understood that that's not what the early Christians did. The gospel writers weren't intending that, and neither were any of the other writers. They were trying to, to uh, give a witness to Christ uh, based on their understanding of their times and trying to get people to believe in Jesus. And so in order to understand that, biblical scholarship started to look at um, how did the uh, understanding of what the authors were intending for their audiences and understanding that will give us a better appreciation of what the texts mean. And then we can then, because it is the inspired word of God, we can then reflect on that in terms of how we can live our lives in our own times. Yes? Does that mean that before 1943, the Catholic Bibles had no footnotes? That is probably correct. I can't say that for sure, but yes because they weren't giving you that kind of insight, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you got to read it, but what, what language do you think was in? Latin. Latin. Yes. So if you understood the Latin, who understood Latin? <laughs> Those who were over 
I don't want to go into age. Stuff. <laughs> you gotta watch yourself. I'm, I'm being very careful. <laughs> but for those who, because uh, I'm, I'm 65, oh, yeah. and in growing up, I remember in a very small way that my first year or two in church, it was different. <coughs> um, but I don't have a, I don't have a vivid memory of that. Um, and then, of course, I, you know, as I got older, it became more clear it was, in, it was a different style by the time I got into grade school. All right. All right. In 1964, the same biblical co commission, Santa Mera Ecclesia, embraced the historical Christian method that was incorporated into the um, Dei Verbum. This is what that means. Investigates the origins of the ancient text in order to understand the world behind the text. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were doing in the Bible study that we did as we looked at each of the different books. It only makes sense that we interpret ancient texts against the background of what we know about their historical settings. That's what this is saying. <clears throat> the ancient authors, inspired by the Holy Spirit, reflected their own historical situation and wrote to address people of their own time and place. Now, remember when Father Beretta was here and he did a reflection on um, St. John's Gospel, mm -hmm. all right, and talked about some of the, um, one of the passages that he read. And really the passage was reflecting on, if we understood what was going on behind the text, that is that the community, if they acknowledge Christ, would have been asked to, um, they would have been, they, the families would have been broken apart. And so they were very cautious about how to do that and how to speak and, and, and so forth. Um, I'm not going to do a I didn't feel like, I, I was going to do a go through one of the texts, but that's not, not relevant with our time. In, also, in the biblical, there was a constitutional and divine revelation. And we've talked about this in our Bible study, too. The focus of this document is the Bible. They gave the Bible back to the people, it says. Scripture comes alive in the life of the church. Access to sacred scripture ought to be wide open to the Christian faithful. That's clearly the Second Vatican Council, and I think we've all experienced that over the last 50, 60 years. The books of the Bible are written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and they were written by human authors. God acts in and through them. We, that's firm teaching of the church. The use of the historical critical method is now permitted, and translations of the Latin Vulgate are allowed after November 18, 1965. One of the things that they, the, the writings, and look at the, look at the numbers, 2,344 to six. So it really gives us a sense that as these documents were written, there was a great deal of unity among the, um, um, fathers of the Second Vatican Council um, and, and the priests and bishops and all that. Um, yes? The Julie Raines version of the Bible was before 1865. Before 18 or 1965? Or 1965. Because that was during um, the time persecution of the church in England. And that was an English translation of the Bible. And that was based on what church were we talking about? The church of? The, the, the Catholic church. Catholic church. So what are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just uh, what you just had up there was the word. There, I, I wrote the word permit it. So now they, they gave permission for people to um, legitimately read scripture um, in the Vulgate. Now, uh, okay, all right. So this was probably, this was, Julie Raines was a seminary. Could be, and, and, yeah. and I don't know much more about it than that. It, it was set up in France to Or uh, to, to develop priests to go back to England. Right. 
the um, liturgical movements, we have two more movements to do. The liturgical movement is the one probably we're all most familiar with that took place through this. Um, before Vatican II, after Vatican II. Now this is a little bit, uh, this was the chapel of the seminary uh, that I lived in um, that we sold in 2012. Um, that's my, if you've noticed, that's also a picture of my uh, screen. What do you call that? Screen yeah. saver. Thank you. But to give you some different, there were, it's certainly a very, there's, the, 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 re, the things were changed. So Pius X called, now this is going back to 1910, called for full active conscious participation of all the faithful in the liturgy. He enacted that children should receive the Eucharist at the age of seven. So we have that going on. Um, and then Pius XII wrote an encyclical in 47, the encyclical in the liturgy that gave officials but cautious approval for liturgical renewal. And Congress on Pastoral Liturgy uh, in Assisi stressed the unity between the Word of God and the bread of life. But it wasn't until Vatican II that all that comes to a different perspective. Before Vatican II, priests read Mass in Latin with their back to the people. The liturgy was celebrated in the vernacular <laughs> with the people, the priest facing the people. He alone read the readings and gave out communion, only the priest did. The laity performed ministries that used to be exclusively performed by the priest. In all too many cases, the people were just silent spectators at mass, thus they prayed the rosary a lot. Laity were called to full active participation here. And that is, um, um, <coughs> and there is some desire for people to, to want to go back to these things, but I don't see the Vatican cha changing that because of where things are. In fact, the church wants us to continue to make sure that the liturgy is um, in a way that is not, it's, there's, a, there's a twofold caution. And of course, everything's within balance, correct? Um, so on the one hand, it is allowing the symbols um, and the, the design of the liturgy to, um, to be mystery and powerful. And at the same time, for us to be fully engaged in it as much as we can. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the best way to fully engage in the liturgy would be through the, through the senses. <clears throat> so the liturgy has a lot in terms of the way we celebrate it in engaging all those senses. So we eat, right? So that's where we get with the, with the body and blood of Christ. We, we can touch it. We can shake hands with people, right? Sometimes there's incense for us to smell. There are flowers to kind of highlight the kind of season we're in. There's color to capture where we are in the liturgical celebration. Um, the caution is, is that that has to be done in a way that is delicate so that it doesn't become um, a performance and a show, right? Because the, the idea is it's not about making me sit back and watch this wonderful production. The idea is that it is to be uh, well done so that it invites people to be engaged in their senses in terms of the prayers and the music and the celebration so that one can enter into the mystery and, be, and th therefore not be in sit back and just kind of, but to be engaged as much as possible. And as you know, that's a delicate balance of, you know, when does it become show and when does it become uh, an, an opportunity to engage people into the experience. Um, and one of the challenges I've discovered in my 10, almost 11 years of priesthood is that every time we celebrate mass, I have to remember, even if I've done it three times, the, the one time I'm doing it right now has to be as if I've never done it before. That's kind of the mentality that one needs to enter into the liturgy. I enter into it as if it's not just like a routine thing, but I'm entering into a powerful mystery where I'm gonna to touch the divine and literally in receiving the gift of the Eucharist. And so that's the theory of the Second Vatican Council and invites us into that. And um, the way to do that is that 
that with that collegial sense, the community does as much. So in some ways, I should not be doing parts that are not mine, all right? I should not be doing the readings, all right? I should not be serving the mass. Um, I should, there, there are people that do all those things. And that's because that's the whole communities. Each of us have our parts into it. And in some ways, although the priest stands in, um, um, in, the, in the person of Christ, but he's one among many, mm -hmm. all right? And that is the whole community that is engaged in this. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Celebrating the liturgy, all right, so there, that's just a, another. So, uh, the sacraments <coughs> are very much were reformed. Again, look at the numbers. Um, 2147 verses 4. The document led to the reform of the way we celebrate all the sacraments. Confessionals are replaced by reconciliation rooms. Um, the um, it is a danger to take away people's options. In other words, reconciliation rooms should be a place where people can have face-to-face -face or private, and that shouldn't be taken away. Baptisms occur at the Sunday liturgy, right? That's a hard one to kind of get people to do. Um, and I understand, you know, and, and it's a challenge because the baby's gonna cry, and then how do you, but, as much as I can try to encourage that, I do. Last rites become the sacrament of the sick. Uh, what's added in the last rites, I mean in the sacrament of the sick, is that if a family member is dying, and they're on hospice, and they're at the end of their life, it's not called last rites, but there will be given an apostolic blessing in that moment. And that apostolic blessing forgives them for all their sins for all their life. It's only given the end of a person's life, but it's not last rites. And if one doesn't get it, doesn't mean they're going to not go to heaven. But those are the, so. But there's still some of that. When a person's dying, they want the last rites. That's not there. Liturgy of the hours is now something that uh, used to be just prayed by priests, religious and sisters, and is to be encouraged by the laity. Um, as I was writing this, I remind myself that. That's something that I think needs to find its place here a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we provide an opportunity for the laity to pray the office uh, and those prayers um, at one occasion? And I'm working on that. Any questions with liturgical? I think we're all familiar with the, the movement. Yes? How does the, um, the parishes that offer the full Latin Mass, how does that mesh with all Technically, it doesn't, right? But to respect people's desire to, to experience that, um, the, that is, I don't know what the newest version is. My, my, the last time I read stuff on it, because I, I don't understand it because I didn't grow up in that experience, um, is that it had, um, I think there could be one church in each diocese where that could be offered for people to have an experience of it. <clears throat> right. And WTN has a lot of Latin. Yeah. Yeah. And that is an appropriate to experience, but it should not become, and that's why it was kind of restricted to one place, because the, the right is more about the full active conscious participation, and that doesn't allow for that. It's permitted, but it doesn't meet the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, but it's respecting tradition and some people's desires. Yes? Why was the tabernacle moved from the high priest the altar off to the side? Was that part of all this? That, uh, no. Um, okay. It was um, providing uh, initially in the spaces for people to be able to, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton is a good one where they have a little space where you can sit around the benches and you can have like a little blessed sacrament chapel almost, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that one could go into uh, there and just have a private, and be a little bit closer to encountering Christ in that kind of way. Um, today, the, 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 the desire is to have it as close to behind the altar as possible as one option. Mm -hmm. um, the tabernacle should be in a place where everyone in the church can see it from wherever they're sitting. 
That's the you can't see St. Joseph's Tabernacle. St. Joseph's down a couple of steps, and the priests have their back to it. Yeah, so that probably could be encouraged to be relooked at. But the idea is that it should be seen. And my understanding is here, when they put the handicap ramp in, that's where they chose to put it. Uh, I wasn't part of that, but some places will have it right behind. Having it right behind, as long as it can be seen and is accessible without a long procession to get to it, is appropriate. Um, but it should be a place. Now here's another little tidbit around um, liturgy. Uh, when mass begins, when mass begins, and and one enters the church, where does the center of focus go to? The altar. The altar. So that's why we have um, um, we 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 have a uh, sacred bow to the altar, um, because the altar is the focus. Not that the tabernacle is not, but the tabernacle is there, and the presence of Christ is there. But during mass because of what's gonna happen at the altar, that becomes the focus of where we should be bowing and so forth. When mass is not a, in, in, in <coughs> taking place, then it is appropriate to draw our attention to the blessed sacrament, and then you would genuflect. Just kind of, that, and that's all things that evolve from the Second Vatican Council. But how everyone, how, how one reverences the Eucharist needs to be reverent and not, um, so commonplace that one, um, for example, the chapel is not a place to run around, <laughs> you know, where the blessed sacrament is for that reason. So. Okay, the last piece is the ecumenical movement, and that is the connection between um, other faiths. The ecumenical movement mm -hmm. started in the early 20th century, was largely without Catholic involvement except for some limited unofficial dialogue in the 1920s. The theology of the church forged at Vatican II presented the relationships of the church with other Christian traditions in a more positive light. All right. The church gave the green light for full participation of the Catholic community in the search for Christian unity. Mm -hmm. And the word for that is ecumenism. In this process, the council fathers gave greater consideration of the church's relationship to Judaism and other world faith religions. The basis for this dialogue was generally expanded in recent years and has now given a greater priority in the 21st century for the sake of peace in the world. The church in the modern world, the document was called Gaudium et Spes. I love this title, the church in the world. Prior to Vatican II, the church had a fortress mentality towards the world. This was symbolized by the fact that the Pope was seen as a prisoner of the Vatican, never leaving it to visit his flock. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Paul VI was the, one of the first to show that, mm -hmm. and then John Paul II was really a, quite a model of, of that. This document speaks to all men and women of goodwill seeking to cooperate with them to build a better and more just world, whatever faith they're living and trying to respect people for that goal of living justly. Again, um, 2,307 to 75, still a great deal of unity in their um, voting on that. <clears throat> Gaudium et Spes, this is the longest of the 16 documents, and I just kind of listed some of the things that this document addresses. The desires, dignity, conscience, Atheism, social justice, culture, how the church can serve the world, how development of the world benefits the church, marriage and family life, political action, world and peace. A lot of this is about, you'll find a lot of di uh, dialogue uh, about um, concepts such as um, just war and reasons why uh, engagement in war would be ju a just cause. Building an international community. And this is very much threatened today because there's a lot of nationalism that <laughs> was, says we just need to worry about ourselves and no one else. Right. And that, that is a piece that I think the Second Vatican Council has a lot to speak to. That's just that. 
And then there's some, some uh, documents on social communication, priestly formation, missionary activity, and Christian education to give direction to those um, issues. And I think I would like to pause there. Um, more documents. The Deccan Vatican document is just lots of documents. But just to give you some sense of the movements. Liturgical, ecumenical, ecclesial, and biblical. biblical thank you. Are the four major themes. Father? Yes. Can you talk about the charismatic renewal? Yes, but it's changed a lot. Uh, I don't, I would, I, in, the, in the couple of minutes, I would have a hard time giving the specifics. Because it happened before my time. I don't know where is it today in its involvement. Um, it was a movement that was focused on the Holy Spirit. What's, what's um, the question, Father? What is the, um, where is um, the charismatic, charismatic movement? movement. That was really oh, important. thank you. Okay. Which was very powerful in this day. Um, and I, it's big people were speaking in tongues and falling yeah. down. And yeah, and I've really never had any experience of it um, in, in my own, but I, yeah. so I don't really, can't, I can't speak to a whole lot of it. Um, well, I, I know you did a series on the catechism, but did the catechism come out of Vatican II? Um, the catechism came, yes, in some ways, because the catechism gives us a more comprehensive... All the catechism is before Vatican II. Yes, but this is the, this new version of the Catholic catechism. It's more comprehensive. It's not just like questions and answers you need to memorize. So this was giving us historical basis for how things got to be where they were and and and, and reflections on that a rule book on this too. right well it's supposed to, not supposed to be a rule book as much as it is a guide to understanding so so one of the things that I think could come uh, moving because I certainly need to figure out you know and I want you like to just to think about this and then we can uh, I was thinking maybe June, July, August, we could have a, between the whole three months, maybe have a four to six week session. Because um, I know last week people had some desire to do something in the summer. And then we have a fall series. So to think about what are, as we look at these things, what needs finer reflection so that we can continue to, to learn. Because now in three years, we have, we have captured a great deal of, um, theology, but we've only really still scratching the surface. So maybe where do we need to go a little deeper? Just kind of think about that on your own, and then I'll pull you a little bit on that and begin to shape what we want to do from here on out to continue to learn. Uh, so next week, a little bit on my, uh, uh, American church history, and then we'll go from there. All right? Thank you for your questions. Thank you, and